morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative modern fiction. We are talking about short story in the modern and postmodern era and uh, this is in continuation with our previous discussion on uh, Edward Allan Poe's uh, The Cask of Amontillado. So this is a short story we were discussing in our previous class. Uh, we have spoken about the setting. The setting is key to the mood of horror. It creates the mood of horror, suspense and uh, disbelief, the disbelief, the state of disbelief in which we find Fortunato uh, till the end where he cannot believe that uh, a close friend has uh, walled him uh, and, and left him and, and is about to leave him, desert him uh, to his lonely death. Uh, Poe was known as a dark romantic uh, of the twilight, uh, which means that he was one of uh, a group of authors uh, who focused on uh, their work of the dark side of humanity. We were talking about this motif of revenge, of uh, a very calculated revenge that Montresor plans against uh, Fortunato and he is looking for the right uh, moment uh, to, to uh, get back uh, on all the injuries that have been hurled by Fortunato too on him uh, earlier. Um, so we see that uh, evil sin and the capacity uh, within every human being, the, the, the dark side of human, the shadow inside us is something that uh, uh, Poe is really interested in, something that makes us do the terrible things. And we see how calculated uh, Montresor is. He says uh, on the very day he decides to uh, kill Fortunato in, he uh, has dismissed all his servants. So he has, uh, he has no one in the house. He wants to, uh, you know, escape with some kind of, in, with, with impunity. He wants to uh, wash his hand off this uh, heinous act once it is done. Uh, he dismisses his servants, like I said, and uh, we also, uh, so therefore we see that, uh, in a way, this uh, character uh, Montresor is uh, also, he is coward. He cannot, uh, you know, head on collide or conflict with anyone. There is cowardice, there is a lot of scheming. He is a very Machiavellian character, so to say. Uh, he cannot uh, confront uh, a, a haughty, supercilious man like Fortunato. Um, and so he stabs him uh, from behind at his back. Uh, and the, the act of walling someone in, where we know that in the deep, dark alleys where he has left, in, in the deep, deep dark uh, store where he has uh, left uh, Fortunato, he will, uh, he will uh, decay and die. He has left him to rot and die because no one will even know that a living being is there. It's very um, uh, serpentine and uh, danger ridden uh, uh, journey uh, to, the scan to the catacombs and no one, no human will reach there to uh, help him, uh, you know, uh, come out of that wall. Uh, Fortunato is uh, left, he is damned with a very slow uh, process of death that is going to come and, uh, you know, uh, overcome him after a point. Uh, so, uh, the capacity of doing something dreadful, uh, like I said, Poe was, uh, has focused on this in several of his works. The focus on the catacombs uh, uh, is there, but uh, this, I mean, the focus of the catacombs uh, shows us how uh, uh, it functions, the function of the catacombs. So the, the focus and the symbol of the uh, catacomb, focus on the catacomb and, uh, you know, uh, the symbol of the catacomb as a, uh, you know, part of one's psyche, the catacomb as a psychological symbol, for the state of mind of the narrator, the narrator murderer, uh, as understood in the opening sentences. 
the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best as I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that um, I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. Uh, the setting of the story is during a, a carnival. Like I said, there is a Dionysian mood, a dominant Dionysian mood uh, in the story with the way it uh, opens. Uh, and the carnival uh, is taking place probably in Florence, Italy, when characters wear masks and, uh, you know, fine clothing. It is irony that uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, go as you like kind of a setup, uh, the uh, we see that Montres chooses to dress up like a, uh, a clown. So, it when we dress up as someone else, we in a way, it reveals our inner, uh, it reveals our inner self. Uh, he dresses up like a jester and he makes fun of himself by choosing to pursue uh, uh, Montresor. He is, and the names are also very symbolic, the name Fortunato, he is probably from the aristocratic background. This could also be seen, the story could be seen as a kind of uh, vindiction, uh, you know, uh, you know, vindiction, uh, at the level of class, because they originally had a class difference too. Um, we see that uh, Montresor is from uh, a masonry background, right? So he had a struggling past. He is not an aristocrat. He is not uh, uh, traditionally a very rich man. Today, in, in the current time of the story, he has gone on to become wealthy. But the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sense of injustice uh, that uh, Montresor feels against Fortunato could have a, a, cla a class dimension, right? Uh, and everyone wearing mask, it's also symbolic of uh, the, the two selves, the dual selves or the several selves that uh, each individual carry within himself, right? Uh, so, the question of indignation. When uh, someone who is more privileged keeps, uh, you know, uh, humiliating uh, the the other that is uh, not as privileged, uh, also comes into existence. That is a, a kind of question that surfaces uh, when uh, Montresor is planning to take revenge. The symbolic uh, function of the catacombs is something we may want to discuss. Uh, so. Uh, the story goes like this, we had passed through walls of piled bones with uh, casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. Uh, as Montresor leads Fortunato on into the deeper depths of the labyrinthine uh, catacomb, it is very labyrinthine, it is a serpentine and uh, you know uh, a very uh, uh, complex uh, 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 mapping of the catacomb that we find in description. Uh, one realizes that once one enters this kind of a labyrinth, it is very difficult to uh, exit it. Uh, and so, as readers, as uh, we are part of this dangerous voyage, uh, it is also a psychological journey, the psychological state of Montresor that is uh, exposed, that is revealed to the readers. The deeper we get into uh, Montresor's psyche as readers, the more uh, his devilish, his his devilish, uh, sadistic, and horrific uh, aspects are revealed. His uh, thoughts and actions become very very clear to the reader what he is up to, and he knows he has studied, uh, uh, you know, uh, he has studied uh, Fortunato very well. Uh, so, he knows how uh, his, uh, you know, Fortunato is a proud man, he is uh, 
he is extremely haughty. So, he is referring to Lucchesi, who might be a better connoisseur of wine, uh, you know, than, uh, than uh, Fortunato. And he challenges him, uh, which goads, which uh, kind of uh, uh, prods him to go further and further follow, uh, follow Montresor to his own uh, death, to his own uh, coffin, right? Um, so, it is the key that Montresor commits his heinous crime once they have penetrated the depths of the catacombs. So, once they penetrate the depth of the catacomb, they have also penetrated, uh, the reader has penetrated the deep, dangerous, dark side of Montresor's psyche. And once uh, one reaches the end, one is able to express uh, the extreme, extremely disturbed perverse side of Montresor's uh, psychology that is revealed to the, uh, to the reader. Uh, now, the, when a person is walled in, when he is bricked in, uh, it could be uh, a representation of the psychological repression of, of uh, Montresor's evil desires and actions. Uh, one can guess that after this cold-blooded uh, sealing, sealing in of uh, Fortunado and abandoning him there to uh, die, rot away slowly. Montresor is able to put on a mask of respectability of a, a very normal social being and operate in a Venetian society once more, right? Uh, so, the question of mask, how mask is uh, symbolic, what kind of a person lurks behind this mask. Uh, when we are merry making in a, car in a carnivalesque situation, there could be uh, a, a murderer, uh, a cold blooded, uh, you know, murderer like Montresor uh, among us. So, Montresor could be anyone among us. So, how it is a kind of introspection that a poor puts us into. Any of us could be I mean, could uh, harbor that possibility uh, of, uh, uh, you know, that murderer instinct uh, of uh, Montresor in us. Maybe we, all humans, uh, you know, merry making and uh, uh, fun loving, uh, going to parties and doing the normal things, being the social self, have this murderer's uh, instinct in them. They are constantly, we are all constantly wearing a persona that suits us. So, uh, having buried his unacceptable uh, psychological side, just like burying uh, Montres, uh, burying uh, Fortunato, he has buried his unacceptable psychological side. And now, after doing that, uh, Montres can freely partake of normal society again. And the labyrinthine catacombs, therefore, represent the mood of terror and horror. Who himself uh, seems to have had this morbid fear of premature burial, and this theme keeps coming back in, uh, you know, recurrently in several of his uh, short stories, such as the premature burial, the fall of the house of Usher, uh, Berenice, uh, Ligia, and Morella, all of which reverberate this claustrophobic terror of being walled in. Uh, one also finds the case of walling up a victim in the black cat. Um, the fear lies in the buried uh, person still being alive, still being conscious and aware of the uh, horror folding him in, horror enveloping him. Cask of, uh, the cask of Amontillado belongs to the romantic movement in art and it is part of the romantic uh, uh, subgenre of the gothic a tale of horror with the gothic, uh, you know, paraphernalia. We have all the props that support uh, the, the larger, uh, uh, you know, movement or, or the larger uh, uh, discourse of the gothic uh, through dungeons, through catacombs and cadavers, right? We have skeletons, heaps of skeletons. So, maybe this is the kind of place uh, where not only wine is stored, but a lot of secret has been stored for generations. Uh, so many cadavers, dead bodies uh, have rotten, decayed and turned into heaps of bones. It is a, a very grisly, 
a very uh, bone chilling kind of ambience that uh, Poe has successfully depicted through words. Uh, however, Poe transcends the genre of the Gothic as he observes that his horror was not of Germany uh, or, or part of the larger Gothicism, Gothic movement. Um, his, uh, he is not drawing it from any particular movement or cultural uh, repertoire, pre-existing cultural repertoire, but he draws on his own soul. So, Poe was a pioneer in writing psychological fiction, often of, uh, and uh, they often uh, dealt with, struggled with extreme neurosis. Uh, if, uh, so, if not abnormal personalities, we, we could very well uh, say that a man like Montresor is uh, perverse, he is mentally skewed. Uh, he was, uh, so we see that Poe was also an early advocate of the movement uh, of art for art's sake, right. Uh, however, unlike his contemporary uh, writers such as Nathaniel uh, Hawthorne, he did not uh, write moral allegories. He was not interested in writing mor moral allegories. Um, in the story, the murderer gets away with his uh, crime, like he wanted, he, want, he escapes with impunity. Uh, we, for once, we might want to uh, think uh, what happened if, uh, you know, uh, Fortunato escaped this death. Uh, you know, in terms of socioeconomic position, Fortunato is definitely more powerful. Uh, more entrenched in, you know, social power than uh, uh, Montresor. So, Montresor has arranged uh, the situation in such a way that it does not look like a murder till he has ensured that Fortunato is indeed trapped. He, I mean, he cannot be blamed later on. Should uh, Fortunato escape his death, he cannot blame, uh, you know, uh, Montresor. Montresor does his bit. He keeps warning uh, Fortunato and thereby uh, provoking his, his uh, uh, pride by saying that it is a very dangerous place, the catacombs are dangerous, uh, it is very cold and damp inside, not many people can go. Uh, so, it becomes a kind of adventure for uh, Fortunato. He all the more wants to go there because he has been precisely because he has been forbidden. But uh, then Montresor is doing his bit. Should uh, Fortunato stay alive and is able to come out of the catacombs, he uh, cannot be uh, kind of implicated for any kind of crime or offense. As a, uh, as, as a backup, he has dismissed his servants. So, there are no eyewitnesses. So, uh, Poe was a pioneer in writing psychological fiction. This is a vivid, uh, you know, um, exploration of the criminal's psyche, how the, uh, the, the mentality, the, the, the way of thinking of the Avenger works. Uh, and uh, such a thought process is extremely neurotic most often. And if not, uh, you know, um, abnormal, like I already said. Uh, in the story, the murderer gets away, he is caught free. Um, however, whatever meaning the tale uh, offers uh, lies in the portrait of Montresor and, and it is contained in his own words. So, the neurosis is, is almost uh, like he is giving away through writing. After so many years, he is confessing to the reader uh, the, the dark side of him, something that uh, lay buried. Uh, just like uh, Fortunato's body. D. H. Lawrence um, in uh, studies in classic uh, American literature says that Montresa is devoured by the last of hate uh, which destroys his soul just as uh, he destroys Fortunato. Maybe the ghost of Fortunato, the, uh, the, the phantasmal presence of Fortunato comes to haunt him uh, back later. So, critics have pointed that Montresor resembles Hawthorne's uh, unpardonable sinners uh, who suffer from an intellectual pride and, uh, you know, uh, monomania that destroy their uh, human dimension, their humanity. 
So, his revenge echoes a passage from Thomas Nash's Renaissance novel, The Unfortunate Traveller. We see a grain of The Unfortunate Traveller in uh, Poe's Cask of Amontillado, The Cask of Amontillado. I quote, nothing so long uh, of memoir as a dog. These Italians are old dogs and will carry an injury a whole age in memory. I have heard of a box on the year that hath been revenged thirty year after. The Neapolitan carrieth the bloodiest mind and is the most secret fleering murder, murderer. Whereupon it is growing into a common proverb. It'll give him the Neapolitan shrug when one intends to play the villain and make no boast of it. Unquote. So, the nature of the injuries and offense uh, that Fortunato had, had caused to Montresor, however, remain unrevealed. We are getting only the version of Montresor. So, he, according to him, Fortunato has caused him several injuries and offenses. They could have a class dimension, like, like I have mentioned earlier. Montresor appears to be telling his story to someone who has more knowledge than uh, Poe's reader. So, he at, at one point he says, you who know me so well, you know the nature of my soul uh, and who may be assumed to know something uh, of Fortunato's past conduct before this fateful night, something that led him to his own death. So, unlike Montrose's audience, however, Poe's audience, like the readers that are reading the story, have no basis for judging the extent to which Montresor has been humiliated or uh, how, how far Montresor's actions are reasonable. So, the focus therefore is not on the reason for uh, revenge, but on the revenge itself, not on how Montresor behaves as he does, but only on what he does. So, we do not have the before and after of revenge, the entire story uh, highlights and centers on the revenge, the act of revenge and how well, how shrewdly, how cold-bloodedly it has been all planned. Just as Montresor does not reveal his motive for the crime uh, other than identifying it uh, as a crime of revenge, he, it is self-avowedly a crime of revenge. Neither does he share with his audience's uh, response when the deed is done. So, what does he feel like after killing? Does Montresor feel better after Fortunato has been walled in? He has paid for his uh, the insult. Uh, does uh, Montresor feel vindicated? Uh, he has been uh, avenged uh, adequately. Does he uh, celebrate the death of his uh, rival? Or does he smile inwardly years later at the thought of his deed and how he also escaped. Uh, it was a very clean act of murder. He escaped with, uh, you know, punishment. He escaped law with impunity. So, on the contrary, you know, on the, on the, on the contrary, uh, we could also ask it re as readers, has the dead fortunate whose laughter stayed on ringing inside Montes's mind, which makes him write the story, the reader, never, the reader never gets to know all these details. It is left to the reader's imagination and, uh, you know, understanding. So, 19th century audiences uh, scanned the story for hints of negative feelings. Is Montresa sorry uh, or penitent for committing a murder? Uh, does he regret his actions as he nears the death you know, as he nears the end of his own life, uh, does he look uh, look to God for forgiveness? Uh, why is he uh, making this act of confession through writing, through narration? Uh, although, as though he is sitting in in a niche with a you know a friend that knows both him and Fortunato for long, and he is confessing it to his his act, hateful act to his friend. So, there is no hint of, uh, you know, any purgation uh, or probably there are just barest of, hint, barest of hints. Uh, Poe's uh, intention is rather to focus his story 
very tightly and that is once again going back to the form of short story that is how it is considered as a very successful story one could sit and read it uh, at once there would be no requirement for two sittings in terms of the space and time that has uh, elapsed in the story uh, uh, and he does not explore who does not explore the events leading up to the crime nor the results of the crime uh, but focuses uh, vividly on the uh, grisly bloody act of the revenge itself. So, the question of atonement and forgiveness, although the action of the story revolves mostly in, um, almost entirely around the deception and killing of Fortunato, the preparations towards killing him, the questions in readers' minds have revolved around Fortunato's uh, thoughts and deeds before the crime and uh, Montres's thoughts and deeds afterward. Uh, while the time uh, between their chance meeting in this carnival and the laying of the last stone would have taken only uh, five or six hours. So, the entire story is happening within a span of the entire act of murder is happening within a span of five to six hours and there is then revisiting, we are moving 50 years ahead and uh, looking at this uh, hateful incident from in our hindsight, in our hindsight from in, in retrospect, Montresor, what happened in the due course of time in 50 years? Is Montresor deceiving himself or his readers, his audience, when he attributes his momentary uh, sickness to the dampness of the catacombs? That's very striking. So he says that uh, at the point when, uh, at the point of narrating the story, he is sick. Montresor is sick, and he has, uh, you know, uh, he he ascribes the sickness to the dampness of the catacombs. What has happened to Montresor over these intervening years and why is he telling the story now after 50 years? Is he hoping for some kind of forgiveness? Is he carrying a piece of this gruesome incident of the deadly catacombs in him? Is he carrying the ghost of uh, Fortunato inside of him? So, the, the dampness uh, of the coldness uh, of the catacombs, is he carrying a chunk of it inside him and all, through all these years he could in fact never get rid of them. So, for forgiveness to occur, there must first be uh, guilt and then atonement or remorse. Uh, now, there is no question of Montresor to ask for forgiveness uh, because Fortunato is long since dead. Nay, there is no way of reconciling with the dead uh, rival and no mention is given of Montresor's uh, paying any reparations to uh, Fortunato's uh, family that survived him like uh, Lady Fortunato. So, atonement must be with God alone, reconciliation with God alone. So, who is this listener? Is he telling, is it, is it a kind of monologue? Is he telling the story to God, God who knows uh, Fortunato as much as he knows uh, uh, Montresor? So, knows every aspect of these uh, characters. At the time of the murder, um, Montessor hears and rejects Fortunato's appeal again and again uh, and he does not stop walling him. So, uh, Fortunato is very helpless, he is drunk, the bells ring, it, it makes him feel like a cattle, uh, a lesser than human kind of a figure. He has been dragged to his uh, death uh, without him being aware. He wakes up to the situation at a very last moment when it's already too late. He cannot go, you know, he cannot escape. For the love of God, Montresor, the murderer replies, yes, for the love of God. But he does not stop building his wall. Surely he does not imply that he is acting for the love of God. He is, in fact, at that moment of, uh, you know, uh, at that hateful moment, he is so full of uh, full, full of uh, envy uh, and other negative uh, emotions. Uh, he is blatantly defying and rejecting godliness in every sense of the term. So, uh, Poe keeps the idea of the Christian God in uh, the foreground in different ways. Fortunato is chained to the wall, and if one look. Uh, if one imagine the picture of the chain for Fortunato absolutely unsuspecting uh, and in a merry mood uh, coming straight from a carnival, uh, 
his position, his standing position, uh, reminds us of the, uh, you know, the crucified uh, Jesus. Uh, the story's last uh, words in past requires step, so uh, rest in peace, are taken from the Roman Catholic funeral ritual uh, that are spoken in Latin. So critic John Grisa believes that Montresor tells the story of his crime as it presumably lies on his deathbed. So there are different uh, interpretations of the story. Uh, people, uh, critics like Grisa would uh, read this as a confession in deathbed. Uh, and he might be talking to an old friend, the you that we find, the person that Montresor addresses as you in the stories, first paragraph, uh, and this you could perhaps be the priest. It could be a priest, it could be God, it could be a monologue within himself. Uh, clearly, Montresor's guilt is established as uh, not just uh, an earthly uh, legal guilt, but uh, guilt in the eyes of uh, a god that both uh, the victim and the murderer recognize, right? Uh, so uh, at the moment when Fortunato was dying, uh, he, uh, he pleaded mercy in the name of God. He pleaded to be uh, set free in the name of God, but that never happened. Um, was Montresa ever sorry? Who does not uh, appear interested in answering this kind of a question? Although he surely knows that he is raising such a question in the minds of the readers. That is the masterpiece that who produces. Uh, he provokes uh, certain questions. Uh, the readers are intrigued to know further, to uh, you know, uh, discover further facts about the story. But some of the ends are uh, left open. He doesn't try try to tie those ends. Uh, and so uh, the answer to these questions um, remain tantalizingly out of reach of the uh, reader. Hardin Craig would say that the first paragraph of the story uh, itself contains the kernel of the theme of revenge. Dorothy Norris Fort, uh, notes that revenge is not only the motive of Montresor's uh, burying Fortunato alive, but also his motive in telling the story since he failed to make sure that Fortunato understood uh, at the time that he was the victim of revenge. And since revenge is not revenge, when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who had done the wrong. So Robert Fossum further suggests that Montresor acts out of revenge for a wrong he thinks Fortunato had done to him in the past and that his sense of guilt sickens him and finally brings him uh, 50 years uh, from the point of action uh, to tell the story to someone. So I, I would like to conclude with uh, uh, reading some excerpts, especially from, you know, parts where they are traveling, they, they are uh, walking uh, into and uh, deeper, deeper into the catacombs and uh, then in the end, when the act is done and the confession happens, what happens in the end? Uh, let's see. The nighter, I said, I here being Montresor. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the walls. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back. Ever it is too late. Your cough. So... Montresor is warning Fortunato. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draught of the middle. I broke and reached him a flagon of the grave. So, in the name of the, you know, uh, the, what they are consuming at that moment, the grave, right? He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He is uh, completely tipsy and uh, uh, he is uh, stoned. He is so drunk. Um, he laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. Uh, a man dressed like a clown, making grotesque movements, moving towards his death in a drunken state. 
You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the brotherhood. How? You are not of the mason. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A mason. A mason, I replied. A sign. A sign. It is this. I answered, producing from beneath the folds of my roquelaire trowel. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us, pro let us proceed to the Amontillado. The Amontillado becomes the weakening sign that, that almost, uh, you know, uh, attracts him to his death. So the trowel also symbolizes the weapon. He doesn't show a knife. It, the moment Montessa takes out the trowel, which is a sign of his uh, masonry background, uh, you know, uh, Fortunato recalls, he cannot believe. And this is going to act as the final weapon. So, a moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. It was the end of the story we are here. Uh, in its surface were two iron staples distant from each other, uh, about two feet horizontally. From one of these deepened a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontia, though, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment, I had scarcely laid the first tire of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry. The cry also has some kind of uh, raw animality about it. It's almost a, 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 a bovine cry, a, an animal crying. Uh, a helpless animal that is tied and cannot move from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a, donkey, of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tower and the third and the fourth. So the details in description, uh, that is the masterpiece uh, of Poe. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. That's you know, when he has woken up to the reality and he wants to escape but it's too late. The noise lasted for several minutes during which uh, that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction I seized my labors and sat down upon the bones. So think of uh, the grotesque inside a man. A man that has after this act uh, roamed in a free society like a, uh, a, a normal social human. He's sitting on a heap of bones and enjoying the, uh, the, the last cry for help uh, of a man who is going to uh, rot and decay and, and, and uh, you know, lie there forever. Uh, and, and he will give up his ghost crying and, uh, you know, inside a wall. So, so I sat down there to enjoy the morning, the helpless crying. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel. The trowel is a weapon, the trowel is a symbol. All of these symbols, I mean, uh, help the story establish this motive of revenge very well and finished without interruption uh, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tire. So, this uh, intricate detailing of uh, the act of murder, the murder, the act of walling in. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, the, the detail of uh, Montresor is present through his act, his, his character. The wall was now nearly upon uh, a level with, with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambooks over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. So, uh, we see that there is a lot of, uh, you know, 
crying follow la laughter following crying and uh, the the story blurs out in the end uh, the way it is narrated by Montres so, uh, we never know who is laughing and crying and uh, the reader might want uh, might might think the reader might think uh, that a piece of uh, you know fortunato has lingered has stayed on with uh, montres it never quite uh, uh, left him alone so the haunting you know the crying laughing kind of hysteria there is a kind of hysteric tone we get in the end so we know that uh, the ghost the the uh, phantasmal presence has uh, ever since been there with fortunato it has it has perhaps driven him mad in a state of hysteria his recounting the story after so many years thank you and i'm going to meet you again with another round of discussions at another lecture